I'm very grateful to some friends of mine who reminded me last night that I had the early morning meeting this morning. Because <laughs> it had not consciously lodged in my mind that I had that additional meeting on Thursday morning. <laughs> so they reminded me last night. I said, oh, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> so three steps to victory we've been looking at. Step number one, which is cemented in place, hopefully, in your mind. Come to the cross daily. And claim the benefits. of his atoning death. That is the single most important habit that can be established in the life of a Christian. It moves you into belief every single day. And among those beautiful benefits, I'm not listing them again because I've drilled them into you by now, among those beautiful benefits that God has lifted from you through the death of Jesus, he's lifted condemnation. guilt, he's lifted condemnation. condemnation, he's lifted judgment, he's lifted the second death. All those things have been lifted from you as a sinner and placed on Jesus. And if you come to the cross every day and you see afresh how generous God has been to you in the offering of his son, you should be in a position to lift up your heart and allow praise to come forth from your lips. Amen. And the moment you do it, step number two becomes a reality in your life. The Holy Spirit will bring the living Christ into you. You will have the mind of Jesus. Amen. Death precedes life in spiritual matters. Have you got it? Drat, I forgot my antidepressants again. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got it? Yes. Wow. And do not assume that establishing a habit of this nature is an easy thing to do. Do you know what I sometimes have to get people to do? I have to get them to get a friend to telephone them 60 mornings in a row. Think of the commitment. We're speaking commitment now, and you all know the difference, don't you, between commitment and involvement. It's like a ham and eggs breakfast. It's a great Adventist illustration. <laughs> Because in the ham and eggs breakfast, the chicken is only involved, but the pig commitment. is committed. <laughs> We're speaking commitment now. If your willpower is insufficient, it's like when you go to AA, you have a buddy. Well, it's the same. This is like a spiritual AA. Some of us, and like myself, were not raised in homes where these habits were established in our lives as children. I'd never set foot in a church till I was 18 years of age. And by then your habits are pretty well formed. And I've discovered something very painful. Establishing habits as an adult 
is far more challenging than doing it as a child. <laughs> so sometimes I have to get people to get a buddy who cares enough, who is committed enough to call them 60 mornings in a row and lead them to the cross. I know I was in South New Zealand a few years ago staying in an old farmhouse with about 30 other people. There were bodies everywhere. And they put me in a little cubby hole under the stairs. It was the worst possible place. Because upstairs were lots of bedrooms and people were running up and down. The bathroom was downstairs. And people were running up and down the stairs all night. And just outside this little cubby hole under the stairs was the telephone. <laughs> and I'm inside in my little dark cubby hole. Door is shut. I'm dying for lack of oxygen. And the telephone rings at five o'clock every morning. And I'm a little embarrassed because I'm just inside the door and the telephone's just outside the door. So I can hear every word that is said on the telephone. And every morning the same footsteps came down the big staircase, an old creaky staircase. The same young lady answered the phone every single morning for the whole week that I was there. And the first morning it took me a while to register what was happening. A friend of hers was calling her at five o'clock every morning to lead her to the cross. Amen. And it finally dawned me, my goodness, she's doing, someone is actually doing what we have recommended to them to do. Because <laughs> she confessed to me when I was talking to her later that she was unable to get this habit in place. And so she reached out to a friend and that friend was calling her. Five o'clock was the only time they could really get together on the phone in the morning. Yeah. This young woman, beautiful young woman, was teaching at our college in New Zealand and she just did not have this habit in place in her life. And on the final day that I was there, I'm listening for the five o'clock call again. I'm kind of enjoying it by now. <laughs> and on the final morning... The young woman who was receiving the call turned it around and she said to her friend on the other end, I would like to take the lead this morning. And I would like to lead you to the cross this morning. I believe I'm ready to do it. And she led her friend to the cross and they were rejoicing and singing the praises of God together. I get emails from that young lady. She is giving God the glory to this day. And she tells me that her ministry to the students has just blossomed dramatically because her peace of mind and her trust in God and her conscious presence of Jesus in her every single day is now so beautiful, she is compelled into ministry every single day. You know, you don't have to pump yourself up to go into ministry. You know that, don't you? It should not be so difficult to get people to go out into ministry, you know. The secret of ministry is to have Christ in you Amen. because Jesus is compelled to minister. Amen. And if he's in you every day, and he will be if step number one is in place, you will have the living Christ in you. And I've got news for you. When Jesus is in you, you suddenly see ministry everywhere where you never even used to notice it before. Jesus has an eye for people who are hurting. He seems to read the human heart. He knows when to reach out to somebody and share good news and encouraging news with them. It's positively dangerous, I'm proving this, to have Jesus in you and get on a plane. <laughs> because it puts the other passengers on the plane at great risk. Because <laughs> if there's only one person on the plane who's seeking, 
the kingdom of God, you know exactly where they're going to be seated, don't you? If I don't actually look up and say to God if I'm getting, as I'm getting on the plane, if I don't say to God, I'm a little tired today, I wouldn't mind a break. If I don't actually say that, God will have that one person sitting next to me on the plane every single time. Uh, several months ago, I was flying to Honolulu and I was very tired. I decided to take a few days in Hawaii because staying home is not such a break anymore. <laughs> and uh, some people call my house the hotel. You know? <laughs> and uh, I was so weary that I made a last minute decision to take four days in Hawaii. So I called up and they said I had the second last seat on the plane. I said, oh, well, at least I'm on the plane. I said, where is the seat? Because I like to sit in specific parts of the aeroplane. They said, well, it's, it's the middle seat in the back row. I said, oh, well, how delightful, just near all the lavatories. You know, be... <laughs> but at least I'm on the plane. So I got on the plane, I found my way to the very back row, and I'm sitting in the middle seat. The seat on the aisle was vacant, but they had told me that it was actually occupied. Somebody would occupy it. But it's getting close to takeoff time, and I'm secretly hoping that the seat will remain vacant because I'm in such a weary condition. But I had forgotten to tell God how weary I was. <laughs> dangerous, dangerous. Anyway, they're about to shut the door of the plane. They announced they're going to be shutting the door of the plane. And there's a little commotion up the front and a young man, long hair, straggly beard and a backpack. I said to myself, okay. I should have known. <laughs> I know where he's going to be sitting. <laughs> and he almost ran up the center aisle and he plopped himself down, stuck out his hand and introduced himself as John and I told him I was Bill. He said, you won't believe what's happened to me. I said, try me. <laughs> he said, I missed my connection in Salt Lake City. So I had to take a later plane, which means I missed my flight from Los Angeles to Honolulu. So they, put, they decided there was one seat left on American Airlines. And it's this seat right here. He said, so I've missed two flights and this is only one seat left on this plane. I said, welcome, I've been expecting you. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I wasn't even meant to be on this flight. I said, I've been expecting you. <laughs> and he looked at me in amazement and he said, well, what do you do? I said, oh, what a great question that is. <laughs> I said, I'm in ministry. And I have ministry towards people whom God sits next to me on aeroplanes. <laughs> and he looked at me with a bit of a puzzlement on his face. Oh, he said, you mean like me? I said, exactly, I've been expecting you. <laughs> so tell me why you are sitting next to me. We have five hours together. There's got to be a very good reason why we're sitting together for five hours. He said, you're in ministry. I said, yes, I did say that already. I'm in ministry. He said, well, two weeks ago, a buddy of mine led me to Christ. Wow. He said, I've never been a Christian. But two weeks ago, this friend of mine led me to Christ. And he said, I'm kind of like a sheep without a shepherd at the moment. I don't know what to believe, where to turn. I know nothing. I said, well, that's about to change. <laughs> because God has seated you next to me. Because I know plenty. <laughs> and you know nothing. It's a perfect combination. <laughs> and so I forgot how tired I was. I put out my Bible and we studied together for five hours. Amen. We prayed together. This young guy was just eating out of my hand. I said to him, you know... I actually have a friend over here who's a pastor who would love to get his hands on somebody like you. <laughs> he could nurture you. He could feed you. 
He could grow you. He could even provide you with a community of other believers who would encourage you. Amen. So I've handed him over, and you know what's going to happen, don't you? Oh, yeah. There's no question in my mind what's going to happen with this young man. And I look back on these kind of experiences and I say, wow. And God goes, tap, tap. Yeah. Remember, this wasn't you. <laughs> this was me. Amen. In you. And I'm slowly learning that I should give God 100%. Because there's nothing in me that leans toward leaning a sinner to Christ. I'm too naturally selfish for that. Amen. This is Christ in me who cares Amen. enough that even though he's really tired, he'll spend five hours breaking the bread of life with a hungry young man. We prayed together on the plane. It was the sweetest experience. It was like having an empty book given to you just to write in. You know? What a profound opportunity. I'm having these experiences every time I fly. I have a little saying I say to people now. I look at them and after I've introduced myself, I say to them, do you realise you're sitting in the safest seat in the aeroplane? <laughs> they say, no. They said, what makes it so safe? I said, because it, you're sitting next to me. <laughs> I work for him. And so there's a squadron of angels out there holding up this plane. You know? And unless God's done with my usefulness, this plane's going to arrive safely. You know? We don't have to worry. When you're speaking to one person, you have an audience. Oh, absolutely. Oh, believe me. How, yep. Have you seen results? Oh, yes. I've... I've had people several cease back because I, you know, you don't realise how loud your voice is sometimes, you know. I think I'm whispering and people are hearing me six seats back, you know. They'll come up and say, oh, we really enjoyed that discussion, you know, that study. <laughs> so our second point is a big one, isn't it? If you're coming to the cross every day, and we're still on that second point, yet we haven't finished with it. God's response is to put his spirit within you, which is another way of saying he will bring the living Christ into you, as we read yesterday. You're actually going to be privileged now to put on the mind of Christ. You will put on the mind of Christ. So open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Let's have a little time to study with one another this morning. Romans 12 and verse 2. It's one of, another one of these great Pauline verses. You've got two statements and they're joined by Paul's favourite conjunction, uh, which in Greek literally reads, we don't usually translate it in English that literally. Sometimes our Bible just says that. Sometimes our Bible says so that. But it literally reads in Greek in order that. It's more emphatic than we translate it in English, there are two statements here and they're linked together, either by that or so that or, as the Greek reads, in order that. And let's look at the first statement. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. transformed. There's a big word coming out here. Be transformed by what? The renewing. The renewing of your mind. I think I mentioned yesterday we're not into holy flesh. We believe the Holy Spirit makes direct contact with the mind. That's how God makes his personal individualized contact with us through the mind. It took me years to realize that he's actually imparting at that moment the very mind of Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Have you ever considered 
for that is a great miracle. Amen. Divinity becomes one with Amen. sinful humanity. Think about that. Think of the implication of this. I'm fascinated by every time a member of the Godhead comes to earth, they always take on humanity. Jesus came to earth. He took on humanity. The Holy Spirit comes to earth. He speaks through humanity. He moves into the minds of sinful human beings. God seems to specialise in indwelling sinful flesh. I think I mentioned to you yesterday that here God is dealing with the sin problem, but here he's now dealing with the sins in our lives. A world of difference, by the way. If you don't let God take care of the sin problem, you're never going to have freedom with the sins that are in your life. I hope you're hearing that. If you don't let God resolve the sin problem so that he's no longer looking at you as though you are under sin, he now sees you as being under grace. grace. Amen. I'm going to say it again lest anyone hasn't heard it yet. If you're under grace, you can actually be free to make a mistake without losing your grace status. Amen. It's only a person who's under grace that comes in repentance to their father when they mess up. That's what grace is all about. Amen. Some people think if you're under grace, you can never, ever possibly make a mistake. I don't know what kind of humanity they've got. I don't identify with it at all. If you're under grace, you are free to repent when you make a mistake. That's the meaning of grace. Amen. God will also teach you how not to continue to fall into. Amen. That's how gracious he is. That's what it means to be under grace. He's already declared you to be perfect. Righteous in his sight. So if you let God take care of the sin problem by lifting from you the guilt of sin, the condemnation that sin has brought upon you, the judgment that it has placed you under, and the ultimate destination of the second death that it will lead to, if you let God lift all that from you, <laughs> I need a drink. <laughs> wow. Thank you for that encouraging sound. I wasn't sure if it was human or not, but it was good. <laughs> if you let God lift from you everything that sin has done to you and place you under grace. It means he's actually broken the stranglehold that sin has had on you. Amen. You are free now to claim Romans 6.11 every morning. Anyone actually claimed it this morning? I have to find one of those antidepressants somewhere. <laughs> we have about six hands went up. How depressing, huh? What is it going to take to move the saints into an active faith experience? <laughs> Romans 6.11, if you claim it every morning, you will consider yourself to be dead to sin no matter how you feel Amen. and you will also reckon yourself to be alive, alive unto God Amen. not because you're feeling a little bolder today 
but because Jesus died and rose again. Because you know now that if it's happened to Jesus, God has credited it to you. Sometimes I say to God, haven't you got a bulldozer? We need to be taking hold of these things every day. It's not enough even to be sitting in camp meeting and hearing this. You need to act upon it if you want all the benefits that God wants to bring into your life, especially the benefits of the holy life of Jesus himself. God is planning, with or without you and me, he's planning to have a holy people, you know. He will have a holy people. So I'm going to ask that same question tomorrow. Hopefully there won't be so many lepers in the camp tomorrow. We may actually see some more hands going up. So if you let God resolve the sin problem, He's going to take care of the sins in your life now. Amen. And how's he going to do it? Grace. He's going to indwell you through his spirit. Amen. He's going to give you daily the mind of Christ. And I've got news for you. The mind of Jesus is not like our minds. Amen. Jesus loves the unlovely. He forgives the unforgivable. Amen. He's so generous I can hardly handle it. <laughs> he hasn't got one selfish bone in his body. He never spends one minute worrying about himself. His whole life is available to be... It's like Oswald Chambers says, he became spilt wine and broken bread in the service of God. That's all you'll want to do if you've got the mind of Christ in you. You'll be happy and content. Amen. You won't be upset about your circumstances. You'll actually be content with your circumstances. You will bloom where God has planted you. Amen. Instead of agonizing over trying to change your circumstances so that things can improve, you'll be totally at peace and you'll just bloom wherever God plants you. That's what grace is all about, you know. I'm running into so many disgruntled Christians today, it's scary. Oh, if only, you know, my husband was a stronger believer. Or if only I could change this person that I work with. I mean, they're so painful. <laughs> is, is that your heart beating? You're excited enough for that to be you. <laughs> it's very impressive. What's that? I can't wait till you get to the second half of that verse. Which verse? The verse that, that you got there, Romans 12, 2. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you for getting me back on track. I'm s <laughs> she does it so well too, doesn't she? You never know she's getting you back on track. That's a great gift. <laughs> All right, so Romans 12, 2, now that we're back on track again. By the way, the word transformed in Greek is the same in English. Did you know that? We have got taken this word from the Greek. The English word is metamorphosis. That's the Greek word too. We got it from the Greek. Metamorphosis, when the caterpillar comes forth from the cocoon as... A beautiful butterfly. That's metamorphosis. So Paul is saying here, be metamorphosed. Don't just have an external paint job. Don't just change your appearance. This is a total and thorough metamorphosis. You're no longer a grub. <laughs> You're now a beautiful butterfly. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Beautiful word coming through here. Be metamorphosed 
by the renewing of your mind. The key is in here. So that, or in order that, and how does the second half, read it out in your version, would you? How does the second half of the verse go? That ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ah, so that you may prove, some versions say no. Same thing. Prove or no what is the good and perfect will of God. Wow. I have a friend who's he started to read horoscopes. He calls me up every now and again and says, Oh, something interesting is going to happen to me today. I say, How do you know? Because uh, it's in my horoscope. And I say, this is a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you no. know what I'm saying? Oh, yes, yes. As though you need a horoscope to know the will of God. I was walking down Venice Beach some time ago. I had some friends with me and I wanted to show them how excitingly weird Los Angeles could be, so <laughs> we walked down Venice Beach. And as we were walking down, some of you have been there, you see all the little umbrellas where the people are reading their tarot cards and doing fortune telling. Anyway, I'm just walking along and this woman who's sitting under an umbrella with tarot cards, she races out and she grabs hold of my hand like this and looks at it. She goes, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she said, if you only knew what's about to happen to you and for $10, I'll tell you. <laughs> I said to her, well, thank you very much for the offer, but actually I know exactly what's going to happen to me. I can tell you, for example, what's going to happen to me in the next 60 seconds. She said, well, how would you know that? I said, because in the next 60 seconds, I'm going to run from you. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned and ran and she... <laughs> I don't need some fortune teller to tell me the will of God, huh? But I'll never forget her face. Ah! She says. <laughs> I don't know about you, but God's already in my future. Amen. I'm not worried about what's coming in the future. My concern is to be in him every day. Because he's in my past, he's in my present, he's in my future. He's got it all under control. And I'm finally learning that whatever comes into my life, if I'm in Christ, is according to the will of God. Amen. If it's painful, it's because he wants me to grow in certain areas of my life. Amen. I accept it finally instead of kicking against the pricks. Amen. What a joyful way to live, huh? Amen. So here's your assignment in groups of twos or threes. Quickly arrange yourself so you've got a partner to speak with. Anyone without a partner? There shouldn't be with this many people in the room, but reach out to anyone sitting alone, pull them in. Here's the question, listen carefully. I know some of you have started already without the question. I, I call that a Columbus journey. Because you know, when Columbus set out for the new world, he didn't know where he was going. When he arrived there, he didn't know where he was. And when he got home, he didn't know where he'd been. <laughs> That's a Columbus journey. <laughs> Here's the question. Now listen very carefully. I'm asking the question a very specific way. If I'm not going to look for the will of God in horoscopes and tarot cards and things like that, according to this verse, where will I seek for and find the will of God. You've got two minutes. Do not sit gazing up into heaven. Do not go into vision. <laughs> Communicate. Where will I seek for and find the will of God? It's a simple question. And it's in this verse. You do not need to become a grasshopper <laughs> and jump through the rest of Scripture. Stay in this verse. Turn to your partner and now communicate. And once again, we're going to break all previous rules and give special 
dispensation for husbands to actually speak with their wives this morning. Okay, let's have your attention, please. Listen carefully. So exciting, by the way, to see so many people digging in the word like this. Doesn't it give you a good feel? Yeah. I think it's tremendous. Wow. Now, before we have a volunteer down here, which is so exciting when you get a volunteer, especially one who's young and looking so full of beamingness here. Look at this. Um, but. My buddy Steve back here just made an interesting comment. Steve, stand up, would you, and take the mic in your usual evangelistic style. Well, there was a problem. Listen, listen. The will of God, it talks about that you've got to prove the will of God. And yes. the only way that you can prove the will of God is if your life is transformed, because then Christ will be living in you, and mm. if he's living in you, then you will be proving that God is righteous and just, wow. and he will do what he has said. Amen. It's an excellent basic statement coming out here. Thank you, Stephen. He's making a serious connection. Prove or no, the will of God depends upon having God in you, being transformed. Yes, and it needed to be said. Thank you for that very clear statement. What was your name again? Kylie. Kylie. Oh, great name too. Okay, Kylie, if you would stand up and the mic is coming to you. <laughs> you got to hold the mic. You don't remember volunteering? No. Are you having a problem with your short-term memory or what? Huh? <laughs> hold the mic even closer, would you? Now, we're all praying that Kylie and her partner, are you two connected here? Today. Oh, today, okay. <laughs> we're praying that you guys are on target today. So uh, the question, and they did ask me just a minute ago what the question was, which caused me to wonder a little. You know? <laughs> but uh, the question was, where do we look for and find the will of God? And I'm looking in the verse itself. So from the verse, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we found that it is by the renewing of our mind that we find the will of God and not be um, looking to things that are not of this world. So in simple, concise terms, where, what is that thumping? It's my heart. <laughs> <laughs> She's learning from you. <laughs> We could get a little orchestra going in here. <laughs> um, uh, it's an excellent statement you've made. You're right on track. So condensing this down in very simple terms, where will you look for and find the will of God? In simple terms. Outside of this world. Come on now, don't lose it now. You've been on track up till now. Still out of the verse. We're just condensing it now. In our mind. Because Jesus has come in. Now, I apologize that the morgue is living up to its reputation. <laughs> you know? Kylie, repeat it again. Will you? Just in case one of these bodies out here is showing any signs, visible signs of life. You know? Repeat it again. You will look for the will of God. In our minds. Amen. Amen. How many of you actually saw that? See how bold they're getting now? Because I know I'm not going to ask them now. Thank you, Kylie. Excellent work, by the way. Excellent work. The will of God is not outside here. I have a friend who gets messages from God from road signs. He reads a road sign. Oh, God's telling me to do this. And I look at him in amazement. <laughs> The will of God, if I have the mind of Jesus, the will of God is in here. It's in here. Let me read it. We can't get rid of that sound. I think it's coming through the speaker. Huh? 
Let me, you'll notice in the margin of my Bible here, I've got a little statement taped. See it there? To remind me of this beautiful statement from Desire of Ages, page 668. Beautiful statement. You need to listen very carefully because it's a, it's a long sentence and yet it's so profound in its implication. Desire of Ages, page 668. If we consent, that's fairly clear, he, Jesus, will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. Did you hear that? Yeah. He will become so close to our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will. Now here's the crunch now. The end of this statement is so profound. So that when obeying him, we shall simply be carrying out our own impulses. Hallelujah. Did you actually hear that? I want to tell you that is a mind-blowing statement. Jesus will identify so closely with your thinking and your goals and everything that you'll just be following what you think are your natural impulses mm -hmm. and you'll actually be carrying out his will. Mm. It's more advanced than anything I've ever read psychologically or whatever. This is an insight into the understanding of the human mind and the will especially. Mm. When you put on the mind of Jesus and Alan White says it again in that other statement from Review and Hill. Unfortunately, I thought I had it with me, but I had a clean out of my Bible. I must have taken it out. You're not sitting on that statement, are you? We've used it in seminars before. <laughs> what a tragedy, Joanne. <laughs> but uh, it's a powerful statement. She says in this article from the Review and Herald, she says, uh, three things happen when you put on the mind of Jesus. You receive his thoughts. You receive his feelings. This should be very encouraging to some of you. Amen. And you receive his motives. Amen. This is an article on the reception of the Holy Spirit. When you put on the mind of Jesus, you're putting on the thoughts of Jesus. Amen. You're putting on the feelings of Jesus. You're putting on the motives of Jesus. And I want to tell you, Jesus does not think, feel, or act as we do. Amen. How many times has God pulled me up and said to me, your ways are not my ways? Put on my mind and my ways can become your ways. Amen. That's his promise. Bill, <coughs> there is one more thing that you put on that I think of at the top of my head when you're putting on the mind of Christ. And that is you put on the hope of glory oh, yes. for the Father. Yes. Everything that you do to prove his, to prove his perfect mm, will mm, mm. puts on the hope of glory for the Father. You see That's this here? Exciting. See that little number? <laughs> You're moving us into tomorrow's meeting. That's excellent. You're seeing it in advance. Praise the Lord. Please. But we can't have those. Use the mic, please. We can't have that understanding unless we have studied the Word. Yes. But you can have it if you are coming to the cross daily yeah. and by faith taking hold of God's gift to you. God's response is, we read it yesterday, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, God abides in him. That's God's promise. You may have that every day of your life. I'm just helping you to see what God's actually giving you. When he brings the Spirit into you and he brings the mind of Christ into you, you are receiving the very thoughts of Jesus himself. 
You are receiving the feelings of Jesus. And you are receiving the motives of Jesus. Was that a hand up here? Oh, yes, I was saying, and you have that by faith only. Oh. So if you have, if you're not exercising your faith, you don't have any of that. No, you won't. You are right. You've stirred George up over here. Okay. Just, it just reminds me of uh, Psalms 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, your law is within my heart. Absolutely. Wow. Well. Of course it is. Powerful statement, George. Powerful. There's another hand over here. I think often when we uh, come to Christ, it, uh, we use the one-way telephone conversation method. Ah, uh, yes, yes. And we, uh, we pick up the phone and we call and we give uh, our conversation. Ah, mm. uh, yes, yes. And we cannot receive anything from Christ. When we hang up the phone, he's there with his mouth. Mm, uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, mm. I'm just about to answer you. And so mm. I think we've lost the art of spiritual listening. Mm, mm. And we need to listen mm. to what he has. Wow. wow. You know. Excellent, excellent. I think even God finds one-way conversations a little phony. <laughs> Back here. Listen. As I was reading in this, I was noticing that it says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Yes. So I don't think that he just drills a hole in our head and pours in what his will is. And when you test somebody, you ask them questions. Mm. And so mm. I think that this kind of encourages us to say, okay, God, what would you have me to do? And then um, as he talked about listening for that answer. Yes, yes. You know, I used to really struggle over knowing the will of God, but now, whenever, and I have a little saying, I say to God every day, even though I know he's doing it automatically to me, I say to God, I give you permission, again today, to bring the mind of Jesus into me. I want to think his thoughts. For the first two years when I started practicing this, I didn't really believe they were his thoughts. And one day God pulled me up with a jolt and he rebuked me. He said, you know, you asked me, to give you my mind, and now you're questioning whether you've got you my believe. thoughts in you or not. You don't believe it. So I move into belief, and I started believing and acting on the thoughts that God was giving me, and wow, a whole new dimension has opened up in my life. I'm seeing issues with such clarity. I'm feeling things that I never felt before. You know, I grew up in tough circumstances in the downtown area of a big city. And the one thing it costs you when you grow up like that is compassion. You're a survivor, you know. I'm the kind of person you could drop anywhere in the world with no money and I'll survive, you know. That just happens to be me. And But God is teaching me that with his mind in me, I can have all the compassion I can handle. I mean, I could, just to give you an example of this, I was, you know, I live in Palm Springs in Southern California in the desert. And one morning I was leaving home to catch a plane from Ontario, which is an hour away. And I looked out in the driveway and I saw how dirty my car was because the sand blows up all the time. I thought, oh my goodness, maybe I'll go down and have my car washed before I leave. Then I can drive to Ontario and leave it in the parking lot there so it can be <laughs> nice and dirty when I get back, you know. So, so I jumped in the car. It's a beautiful sunny morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm just wearing a pair of shorts and a T-shirt. I jumped in the car and I drove down to the car wash. It's kind of almost on the road that I live on. And I put the car in line and I went in and paid the money and I go out the back where you wait. This is quite a modern car wash and so once your car comes through, you don't have to wait very long. It's almost totally dry already. And I've got into trouble with them a number of times because I get talking to people and I forget to pick up my car and drive off. So I'm trying to get better at this, you know. Anyway, I'm standing out the back leaning up against a pole. There's a little roadway where the cars come out. And on the other side of the roadway, there's a small block wall. And I'm just standing there enjoying the sunshine. And I notice there's a young woman on the other side. She's sitting on this low block wall. And she's got a supermarket uh, 
What do you call those things? Cart. Yes, I've called them trolley for so many years I can't, still can't say cart. <laughs> anyway, a supermarket cart. <laughs> hardly flows together, does it? <laughs> trolley sounds so much better. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, this, this cart is full of dirty old clothing and she's picking up each piece of clothing, holding it up to the light, examining it and then folding it up and putting it into a plastic sack. I thought, this is interesting. She's transferring all the clothes. Anyway, I'm just standing there enjoying the sight and the thing that struck me was she's such a young woman because the word homeless has already jumped into my mind. She's obviously homeless. I'm sure some of you know that Los Angeles is the homeless capital of the United States. 80,000 homeless people. And some of them are starting to drift down into the desert now too. And this was a young girl. I said to myself, she can't be more than 20 years of age. Very young. Most of the homeless women are middle-aged or older women. And so I'm, I'm pondering this and the Holy Spirit says to me, knock, knock. <laughs> She's homeless. I said, well, yes, she's, she looks homeless. And God says, well, I'd like to minister to her. So in my mind, I said to God, well, that's what you do well. <laughs> <laughs> and you can never get ahead of God. <laughs> you try. <laughs> and he says, yes, but I usually need a human instrument. I said, yes, I admit you do. <laughs> He said, well, you're pretty close to the scene here. <laughs> you are the closest person. She's only as far away from me, about as far as you are right there, you know. I said, yes, I'm close to the scene, but you know you don't need me to remind you that I'm on a short time frame here. I've got a plane to catch. I've got to get home and get changed and drive an hour to the airport. God says, well, this is important to me. I said, okay. God says, well, I may as well come straight out with it. I'm choosing you. <laughs> I said, okay. So I said to God, look, if it's okay, I'll get my car first. I'm going to be in trouble again with the car wash people. I'm getting a reputation here. Just let me pick up the car and then I'll move it off the lot. Then I'll go and talk to this girl. God said, okay, but remember, this is important to me. Anyway, she reached the last piece of clothing put it in the plastic sack, threw it over her shoulder and she marched off the lot and up to the main street of Palm Springs. I'm watching her. I said to myself, well, seven o'clock in the morning she will be the only person in the main street of the town that I live in. No one else will be up at seven o'clock in the morning. I, I can't lose her. So a few minutes later my car came out, I jumped in, I drove to the edge of the, the lot well, I've got to admit that temptation came over me. <laughs> I could go left and go straight home. <laughs> and I'm looking at the times. Like, mm -hmm. Or I could go right up to the main street, which is a one-way street, and turn left and find the girl. And God says, ah, ah, remember, this is important to me. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I was just tempted for a moment there. <laughs> So I quickly turned to the main street and I drove down the main street and of course she is the only person on the main street, seven o'clock in the morning. And I could see her standing down by a bus stop and she had the sack resting on a bench there. So I drove past her, pulled up, I'm getting out of the car and I said to God, you know, it would save me an awful lot of time and trouble if you could communicate with me exactly what you want me to say to this girl. Well, God says, that's fairly simple. Tell her that I've sent you and that I love her very, very much and that I'm aware of her circumstances. In fact, I'm concerned for her circumstances. And he says, put your hand in your pocket without looking, whatever's there, just pull it out and give it to the girl. I said, and he said, remember, it's from me, not from you. This is all my idea. I said, yes, I know that. <laughs> so I don't know if you've worked with homeless people before, but they are rather skittish. And if you approach them, they'll sometimes back away from you. And so as I walked towards this girl, she started stepping away from me, which I expected. I said, hey, it's okay. I'm really quite harmless. In fact, I'm a Christian. 
And God has just directed me to come and speak to you because he has a message for you. You should have seen the look of incredulity on her face. I mean, she could have written a book on cynicism. You know. So she said almost sarcastically to me, what is this great message from God that I am to receive today? I said, well, it's a beautiful message. He just wanted me to say to you that he loves you very, very much. And he understands the situation you're in at the moment in your life. And I saw a little tear. I said, oh, wow. Why do I ever doubt God? <laughs> she said, did he really say that? I said, that's exactly what he said to me. And he wants me to pray with you right now. I do hope that's okay. Oh, she said, please. So I walked over and as I got close to her, these two skinny, bony arms shot out and they shot around my neck and she pulled my head close to her head and she just held me there and she's weeping weeping like a fountain so I just lifted up my heart and God gave me a precious prayer to pray for this girl anyway I'm lifting her up to God and guess what happens in the middle of my prayer I started weeping I said to myself, okay, I'm standing in the main street of the town I live in, where I know a lot of people. My arms are around, well, she's got her arms around me, really. She's holding me. And I, we're both weeping. This has to be a great sight. <laughs> and God goes, tap, tap. Do you know what God said to me? This was such an incredible moment for me. God says, I just thought you might like to know these are not your tears. You are privileged. This is the first time this has ever happened to me. You are privileged to be weeping my tears. You are feeling. You are feeling what I am feeling for this young woman. And I just looked up and I said, God, I would like to feel your feelings every single day of my life. It's the sweetest experience to know that there the majesty of all the universe is weeping through me just because of a young homeless girl on the streets of the city that I live in. Isn't that incredible? Amen. So finally I had to literally take her arms and pull them apart because she wasn't going to let go. I said, you know, I, I hate to do this but I am under time constraints. But I said, God also wanted me to put my hand in my pocket and share with you. And this is from him, not from me. She said, well, I'm not asking for anything. I said, no, and I appreciate that, but God is offering. Would you be willing to receive from him, not from me? Oh, she said, thank you. I don't know how much was in my pocket. There was 10 or $15 there. And I apologized. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any more money on me at the moment. But God said, whatever was in there is his gift to you. And she took it gratefully because she said she didn't even have five cents to her name. And I'll never forget the sight as long as I live. As I ran back to my car and I was just about to jump in and I turned and looked back. And there's this skinny, scrawny, disheveled girl standing there in the main street waving to me like this. But some joy on her face. And I said to myself, wow. And I looked up and said, you are the most amazing God. And to think that I am privileged to have his thoughts. Amen. I mean, who was thinking about that girl, me or God? God was thinking. I just was just standing there. But God was thinking ministry. Amen. I was thinking too bad. She's, she's hopeless, you know. But God was seeing the heart. Amen. And imagine that you could actually weep God's tears. This is God at his best. So when we put on the mind of Jesus, I want to tell you, ministry takes on a whole new perspective. A totally new perspective. Are you hearing this today? Yeah. I hope you're hearing because he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims that in thinking our own thoughts, we're actually thinking his. Isn't that a miracle?
I'm just going to read the scripture and sit down. What a wise man you are. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, 5, 6, 7. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Mm, wow. That's a perfect description, isn't it, of what we've just been talking about. Down the front here. Philippians 2.13 mm -hmm. For it is God who works in you to will and act according to his mm, purpose. Mm. So Christ in you is the one acting. Yep. Yep. His thoughts, his feelings, and his motives wow. are only carrying out his will mm. and the Holy Spirit in control. A powerful verse to bring out at this moment. Thank you. It is God who is at work in you both to will and to do. That was Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. Powerful, powerful verse. Well, the hardest thing to do for me is to die to self a little bit every day to get closer to Jesus because for us to do... Now you haven't been here all the week, have you? I just been in late Otherwise I'd have to call you to repentance. <laughs> But because you haven't been here all the week, take a seat and I'll just explain something to you that you missed. And hopefully you'll get the uh, CDs. You know, they've been recording the CDs over here. And please uh, make sure you get them from the, the uh, ABC because uh, earlier in the week we realised we studied the atoning death of Jesus and guess what we discovered? That when Jesus died, we died. Our death to sin takes place in his death, not a daily trying to put it down, but daily coming by faith to the cross. And we were claiming Romans 6.11, you consider yourself to be dead to sin. You don't beat yourself, you don't whip yourself, you don't try hard to put down your old way. You come to the cross and by faith, you claim the privilege that in the death of Jesus, your death to sin took place. Amen. You died in him. And it does away with this continual struggle of trying to overcome my old sinful ways every day. It's a faith experience we're moving into, not a struggle experience. This should be very liberating for you, by the way. And I knew you would love to hear that because you're trying to hear the word in these matters. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for this. Please, yes. Jeremiah teaches us how to get the mind of Jesus. Chapter 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Wow. All right, now last comment here because I need to move on. Just two short things from uh, Psalms 34. Uh, verse 8 says, O taste and see mm -hmm. the Lord mm -hmm. is good. Mm -hmm. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. And, and verse 11 says, Come. Ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you for that. Wow. Beautiful scriptures coming through here this morning. By the way, even when you are tempted to yield to your own natural inclinations, if you move into faith and put on the mind of Jesus, you will find yourself responding to situations in a totally different manner than you would traditionally do. Amen. Can you reiterate putting on the mind of Jesus? Some people might not have grasped how you do that. Why don't you stand up and do it for me and it'll be a test now of how effective I've been. <laughs> Thank you for opening that door so nicely. <laughs> I'm confident he can do this, otherwise I wouldn't ask him to do it. <laughs> Listen. Put, putting 
Is that mic on? Putting on the mind of Christ is done by our receiving the Holy Spirit through coming to the cross. Amen. Wow. You should be out here preaching this, brother. You have it clear, brother. Repeat that again, would you? I apologize for the deadness of the body out here. I feel like having a funeral. Receiving the mind of Jesus Christ comes by coming to the cross. And that's uh, 1 John 4.15. Yes. If any man confess yes. Jesus is the Son of God, God is in him and he in him. You didn't repeat your earlier statement word for word. Have another shot at it, this time without changing one comma, okay? Receive, your first statement. To receive the mind of Jesus Christ is by coming to the cross uh, daily. daily. And the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. That's God's response to you coming to the cross daily. Thank you for that. He's been listening very carefully, hasn't he, this week? I was running late for a meeting. And I skipped breakfast. I ran out the door forgetting I should eat something. I said to myself, oh, I'm going to get lightheaded now. I should have eaten something. So I said to myself, well, there's that small deli around the corner. Washington has many little strip malls. So I'll just slip into that little mall there and get something at the French deli. I'll get a croissant or something light. So I pulled in. And even though it was only 7 o'clock in the morning, every parking space was full. I said, ugh. <laughs> the second worst traffic in the country is in Washington, D.C. The worst is in Los Angeles. That's why I moved there. <laughs> <laughs> Punishing myself. Anyway, so I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs, waiting for a space to open up. Finally, several minutes later, I see some taillights come on and a car backs out, so without watching or looking, failing to observe whether anyone else might have been waiting longer than me, especially failing to notice a small van that had printed on the side the name of this French deli. And the Frenchman who owned the deli was sitting at the wheel trying to get a spot in front of his own business so he can unload his supplies. Turns out he'd been sitting there for 15 minutes. Wow. And all I was concerned about was grabbing the space. And I got it. <laughs> and I was feeling so good with myself. And I was about to get out of the car and I looked in the rear vision mirror. And the Frenchman had got out of his little van. You could almost see the smoke coming out of his ears. <laughs> he was steaming. And he came over and with his fist he started thumping my driver's side window so I quickly moved over into the passenger seat. <laughs> and I pushed the button so the window went down automatically. And I moved across lest he thought about thumping me too. And he stuck his head in the car. Because wow. he didn't know that I can hear French, you know. And he is calling me for everything. I mean, I've got a reasonably good French vocabulary, but even I learned some new words. <laughs> <laughs> he had a very profane command of the French language. He was swearing at me and calling me everything, but as I listened, I heard him say, you are one of the most selfish individuals I've ever met. I've been sitting there for 15 minutes, you didn't care, you just grabbed this plate, that doesn't know he's going on. Of course he said much worse about me too. <laughs> anyway, I lifted up my mind to God and I said, God, I give you permission to bring the mind of Jesus into me right now because my natural inclination is <laughs> 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 I'm an Australian, we love a good fight, you know. <laughs> And so I gave God permission to bring his mind into me. You know, I finally the guy runs out of steam. He says, don't you have anything to say? I said, well, it has been a little challenging for me to get something in so far. <laughs> well, what have you got to say for yourself? I said, well, the only thing I have to say is that you are right. Okay. What do you mean I'm right? I said, everything, well, 
not everything, but <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the things you just said about me are absolutely true. I am really a very selfish man. I totally failed to see you. I couldn't believe these words were coming out of my mouth. I did not see you parked there. I'm really sorry about that. And I, all I was concerned about was grabbing the space for myself. And normally I would have said to a guy like that, hey, beat it, buddy, you know. <laughs> Too bad. But because the mind of Jesus is in me, the next words that came out of my mouth shocked me. I said, I tell you what, and I've never done this in my entire life, I tell you what, I will back out. First time for me to ever do this. I will back out. You can pull your van in and I'll just simply wait for the next spot. And he's... <laughs> you know, if I'd cursed him back, he could have handled that. He couldn't handle this. And so I reversed out. He pulled in. I waited several more minutes. I checked carefully this time and... I got the spot and I was about to get out of the car and I looked in the mirror again and I see the little Frenchman coming over again. I said, oh, he's not done with me yet. <laughs> so I got the window down and I moved across again into the passenger seat and he stuck his head in the car and he says to me, I was very rude to you a few minutes ago. Oh, I said, I believe I can agree with that statement. <laughs> He said, but you, you spoke so kindly to me. Oh, I said, that's easy to explain. It wasn't me. And he's looking around. The car. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the only person in the car. Oh, I said, I've got you there. I said, it wasn't me. And I went like this. It was my father. Amen. Amen. Mon Ciel. It was my father in heaven. You should have seen the look on this guy's face. He recovered himself and he says, I said, by the way, you should be very grateful it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, were you coming in to get some breakfast? I said, I was trying to. <laughs> he said, well, you probably know who I am. I said, yes, I know who you are. He said, why don't you come in and have breakfast on me? So, of course, I immediately plan to have a much larger breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I said to myself, oh, hang the committee, you know. <laughs> I'm going to have a good breakfast here, a full breakfast. <laughs> the owner is treating me. And he says to me, would it be okay if I joined you for breakfast? I said, look, be my guest in your own restaurant, you know. <laughs> Join me for breakfast. I said, but why is that so important for you? He's, he had a grin on his face. He said, well, I was hoping that you might be able to share a little with me of how I could. Oh, wow. And I thought, wow, wow. And every time, even today, if I go into that restaurant today, no charge, he'll drop everything, he'll come and sit with me and want to know more about just imagine if I had handled that in my own normal, natural manner, my pugnacious manner, you know? I would have lost him. But God's ways are not my ways. When I put on the mind of Jesus, there is a sweetness. There's a love. There's a gentleness that is not necessarily ours by nature. But it comes into us and God reaches hearts that we might actually alienate Amen. and lose. How's your faith this morning? Amen. 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 We're strong in Jesus. Amen. This is, oh, praise the Lord, huh? Strong in Jesus. This is such a huge thing that's coming out here. I do hope you're hearing this this morning. Amen. That the secret of victory over sins in our lives is to have the mind of Jesus in us. Amen. And the secret of having the mind of Jesus in us, as our brother just spelled out so beautifully, is to come to the cross every day. Amen. Whenever I seek the mind of Jesus, God always turns a situation to his glory every single time. Hallelujah. 
When I handle it on my own or I forget to give God the privilege, I blow it every time and miss the most beautiful witnessing opportunities in the process. So as we conclude this morning, I want you to kneel together in twos this morning. I want you to pray for one another that the person you're praying for will spend today on the campground putting on the mind of Jesus whenever temptation raises its head or whenever an opportunity for really sharing and witnessing to the love of God presents itself, the person you're praying for will have the grace to put on the mind of Jesus by faith so God can be really glorified on this campground today. Please. All right, go in faith, huh?